Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. It's a, a big crowd. People need, there's other seats here. I guess nobody wanted to be very close to me, so they've kind of moved away uh, a little bit. Um, now, it, typically in a lot of different seminar series these days, there's a conflict of interest that people start with. I don't know if it's the, the habit here, but uh, it, it's also kind of nice to let people know where we're funded through or from uh, and what our connections are. Uh, I have no personal conflicts of interest I can state, but uh, um, this report that I'm going to talk about today that was released in October uh, was actually funded by Cancer Care Ontario through their Population Health and Prevention Unit, uh, which uh, Alice Peter is the director of. Uh, the Burden of Cancer Project, on the other hand, was funded by the Canadian Cancer Society uh, Research Institute uh, as part of a multi-sector team grant, and I'll introduce you to that grant in a little bit. Um, we used a lot of data from CAREX Canada, which is funded by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, uh, which is actually wholly funded by uh, uh, um, Health Canada, um, and the OCRC is funded by the Ontario Ministry of Labor, uh, Cancer Care Ontario, where we're actually based in the Canadian Cancer Society. So that was a lot to say, but anyway, uh, we're very grateful to everyone for giving us money. Um, this is the cover of our report. I'm very proud of it. It's the nicest looking report I think we've done, and I really like the way the shovel's about to scoop up this truck. But uh, this report was released in October, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some of the results of this, or the key results of this, our prevention recommendations. But I'm going to start off with talking about what the methods are that we used uh, to produce this report so that people have a bit more uh, understanding of how we actually came about with this. Um, the primary objectives of this report were to uh, really uh, describe and quantify the occupational risk factors uh, for cancer here in Ontario, at least the major ones uh, that are well established, uh, and pre present uh, policy recommendations. Uh, but we also tried to um, propose when we could some workplace-based opportunities. I'll talk more about the policy recommendations today uh, for prevention and then uh, discuss some of the emerging issues, which I won't talk about uh, much today, but um, this report is actually available uh, freely on the web and it's easy to find and I'll show you a link to it at the end of the talk. Um, if people come in and there aren't chairs back there, there are chairs up here and so um, I'd encourage anybody to move forward. The this study, as I said, was, was supported by the Canadian Cancer Society. It was to look at the, uh, both the human and economic uh, burden of occupational cancer across Canada, not just in Ontario, uh, but because uh, occupational cancer, like anything occupational, is primarily under provincial jurisdiction. What we have is basically we've sliced our results primarily into a series of provincial results except for uh, the stuff that the Canadian Cancer Society is interested in or in the case of asbestos, uh, the federal government is using our numbers now uh, when they talk about the impact of asbestos in the new regulations. We tried to be very comprehensive in our approach, trying to look at, and this isn't all the carcinogens uh, that we looked at. We actually looked at about 44 different uh, workplace carcinogens uh, at a lot of different uh, cancer sites. And there are seats up here if anybody wants to sit up front. Um, I'd mentioned that it's a multi-sector uh, team grant, I believe is how they termed it. Um, it really was a national team, although we were, uh, a lot of us were based here in, um, in Toronto. The Occupational Cancer Research Center, uh, I could certainly list more people here, uh, really handled the core of the work for this. Uh, the economic component was led by uh, Emil Tampa from uh, the Institute here. I'm not going to talk a lot about that. That could take a whole seminar in and of itself, and I'd encourage that uh, uh, at some point. Internationally, I'd say th uh, this component is actually getting more attention, whereas uh, domestically, just the numbers of cases, uh, I think, are getting some attention as well, uh, but certainly the economic component is a key part of it. Uh, Carex Canada uh, was involved with it, and I'll talk about their involvement in a bit, uh, and then folks from Montreal um, and uh, UBC, and uh, some of our uh, collaborators from uh, Imperial College of London, as well as some of our international collaborators have helped us out with this as well. 
So the contents of the report really are uh, the number of new cases that we expect annually um, to be uh, due to uh, various workplace carcinogens here in the province. Um, but because we wanted to talk about both the burden and prevention, we also have the number of workers that we uh, you know, uh, predict are currently uh, exposed uh, to these workplace carcinogens still. Um, and we provide a lot on policy recommendations. And for the policy recommendations, I want to thank our policy advisory committee that I've listed uh, here, um, as well as our reviewers who provided further, uh, further advice. Uh, a lot of these names will be familiar to folks. Uh, uh, Ray Copes, Fata Leon, Lynn Holness, Andy King, Catherine Lapel from the University of Ottawa, uh, Rowena Pinto uh, from uh, the Canadian Cancer Society, um, uh, Ellen Simons from the Worker, Workers' Health and Safety Center, Bill Swanson from TTC, and Valerie Wolf from OCAO, and then as well um, our, other, our other folks there. Anyway, I want, really want to thank all those folks. Uh, now, at the onset of this project, we decided we didn't want to make uh, basic decisions about what does or doesn't cause cancer. And uh, this is always kind of a bit of a controversial area. It's also developing all the time. The most well-recognized international uh, agency for identifying what does and doesn't cause cancer is the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Uh, and so we're simply using their evaluations. Um, and uh, they have done a lot of evaluations uh, that are relevant to occupational cancer, really since their inception back in the 80s, uh, but really going forward uh, and still today. Next month, they'll be reviewing or re-reviewing uh, styrene, for example, as a, as a potential uh, human carcinogen. So certainly, we uh, relied quite a bit on, on their evaluations. Uh, the the actual basis of trying to estimate burden uh, really goes back to a very simple formula from the 1950s that really almost all of the different approaches now are based upon variations of this. But, and I'm not going to give you a lot of math and don't worry about that for today, but there are two components here that are important that go into this kind of simple calculation. And while this is very easy to do, calculating the proportion of people who were historically exposed to workplace carcinogens is certainly the by far the biggest task of a study like this. Um, and then reviewing the literature and identifying the relevant uh, studies from which we can draw relative risks was, uh, was the other. Um, but I'll talk a lot today about, about this, or at least uh, It'll be a, a bit of what uh, we're focused in on. Because the challenge here is that when we're talking about workplace cancer, and I put 2011 as our, as our reference year, because when we started the project, that was our reference year. Um, we use a lot of census data, so we end up being on the ones and the sixes uh, for that. Um, but that put us at that point in time. But if you go back and think about many of our tumors, and particularly, uh, our solid tumors, the relevant period, you know, if you allow for a latency period, really goes back almost 50 years. So we're interested in what people were exposed in, in, to in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, if we're going to be trying to predict what uh, cancers are here now. So that's really <laughs> the challenge in this. Um, to kind of start off in addressing this, we use data from uh, Carex Canada, which is a project that is uh, primarily based in Vancouver, but is really a national project um, now that we have staff at here in, in, uh, in Toronto as well, uh, to look at the prevalence of exposure to a lot of uh, workplace carcinogens. And um, that project has been going on now for Oh, I think over 10 years at this point. So it's, it's been a very long standing project, and I think it's, it's delivering a lot of useful, very detailed data that we used uh, uh, a lot in this study. And what, came, what comes out of that is we have um, 520 different occupations, 328 industries, and we tried to look at within occupation and industries what proportion of people were exposed and what their levels of exposure are. And I've just kind of 
to simplify things, I put you know examples of a proportion. You know, where one would be everybody, and point two would be you know twenty percent of people, and low, medium, and high. And, and that's the kind of way that a lot of the um, uh, the Carex, uh classifications go. The low, medium, and high is uh, often set based upon uh, uh, levels of exposure, kind of demarcated by the, the threshold limit values proposed by the ACGIH and which form the basis of most of our regulations here in Ontario and in most of the provinces um, uh, and, um, and other, uh, other types of cut points. Uh, but we took this as kind of a population-based job exposure matrix for those of you who are used to that term. So if I go back to this, we call this the risk exposure period that we were interested in from the 60s through the 90s. Um, and what we did is we took the CAREX data, which was coded using the, the coding systems currently used by, uh, by um, Statistics Canada, uh, the North American Standard Occupational Classification and the National Occupational Classification of, oh God, I probably screwed that up. Anyway, the NOx and the NAICS. And, uh, <laughs> But they didn't use that back in the 60s and, um, and earlier. So the ones that go back furthest is kind of a standard industrial classification that's been used along for a long time here in Canada, and the CCDO, the Canadian Classification uh, of uh, Occupations uh, that we've used. So we, took, we translated those uh, codes into this, and then we simply applied that to the different um, time periods, and in particular to three kind of key intermediate time periods, and that gave us um, the numbers of people that we estimated were exposed in 1971, 81, and 91. Um, then we looked at 61 and 2001 just to kind of anchor our picture here, and then we estimated how many people were exposed in between. So it really is a kind of a historical modeling that we tried to do uh, because there simply isn't data that's available that gives us any reliable estimate of how many people were exposed historically to many of these very common exposures. So we started from that point, and then we started to add to it. And uh, we took our Carex Canada job exposure matrix, which gave us industry occupation province sex level of exposure, when we combine that with the census data, we took label force data um, that provided an age distribution. We took the National Enhanced Cancer Surveillance System uh, data from uh, Health Canada that gave us an idea of how long people stay in particular jobs, because we had to figure that out as well. And what we get is a fairly nuanced view of the labor force over the years and who is exposed to carcinogens, and I've just put one of the axes of this, which is the age distribution. And what you can see is how it changes over time uh, and how we have to kind of reflect those changes because if we're interested in uh, people's cancer risk, we had to know what ages they were uh, when they were exposed. We have to know people's uh, gender and other types of factors as well. So we have this population model that gave us this, but this is how many people were exposed annually. And it gets a little more complicated than that because what we really want to know is how many people were exposed uh, who are still alive in 2011 because that's the year we wanted to look at cancer. So um, this is the this is just by the way these numbers are all from our diesel engine exhaust uh, work, um, and so this would say that 400,000 were exposed in this year and it gradually goes up over time, um, but in fact the new people. What we switched it to is how many people were uh, exposed in that first year, and then how many new people were added to that over time by figuring out how many new hires entered the uh, industry uh, in each subsequent year in terms of turnover. So that's why we need to have that tenure uh, um, component to the modeling effort. And in case I forget to say this, these models were developed substantially by uh, Joanne Kim, who uh, uh, was uh, started off as a student looking at diesel exhaust at, at the OCRC and then stayed on with us as a staff member and is now working on her PhD at McGill. Uh, she got a lot of input from other folks, but she really developed these population models for us. So here we have these new people. And what that tells us is, okay, that's the number of people we have. Um, and this gradually builds up over time um, where there's more and more people who have a history of exposure 
And then because we're not interested in exposures that were too recent, we kind of stopped adding in new people for those last 10 years. But unfortunately, not everybody lives forever. Um, and we had to put in survival. Uh, and so what you see is that um, these folks who were particularly exposed at the beginning of the period, well, there, some of them were quite old by the time it gets to 2011. And gradually, we begin to lose people to survival. And what we end up in the end is this is the number of people that we say were historically exposed as of 2011. Um, and I'm trying to present it in a simple manner, but really a huge amount of work goes into developing these kind of models. But I think it's an interesting one. So as an overview, we took the census employment data and our job exposure matrices, sources, you know, a lot of other data from other places, developed this population model just to give us the proportion of people exposed. Um, and then we tried to combine it with the epidemiologic data that was available. So the studies of cancer in humans that we thought would be relevant to the Canadian experience. So we were kind of looking for Canadian or North American studies uh, if we could find them. Um, we were looking for meta-analyses if we could find them. Uh, sometimes we included uh, Western European studies. Uh, but we were trying to look for relative risk that would be relevant to the experience here in Canada. And sometimes, uh, depending upon the exposure, we might just have the overall relative risk. So it might say, OK, we have a 20% increased risk of cancer among anybody who was ever exposed to such a thing. That's the simplest approach. Or we might have a continuous exposure response set of data. And these, so we have kind of a continuum of these things. And our data here is generated at such a level that we can then generate to match that, and then generally just run it through the uh, further last set of steps and really generate the proportion of people exposed. Now, just to give you an example of that, here is uh, diesel engine exhaust. Um, and this is what Carex Canada estimates say uh, are the number of people currently exposed to diesel engine exhaust uh, in Canada. Mm -hmm. Or roughly currently, it was using, uh, we'll be updating it soon with the latest census data. Uh, but as of the last kind of good census that we had, uh, we were saying about half of the people were in transportation and warehousing. Most of them were low, some of them were medium exposed. Construction was another 94,000, most low, some medium. Mining and gas, only 61,000, but these were our highest exposures, were in mining, actually in underground mining. Um, and you see medium and then low. So these, the kind of color shading here uh, represents low, medium, and high, and the size of the circle represents uh, the proportion of people exposed. Now, public administration, it has a police car here, and that really, that's just because that's a standard stock photo that Carex uses, and I haven't had time to replace it. In fact, for diesel, what we have is across the country, almost every fire engine that we have is now diesel. Uh, engines, uh, whole fleets of our ambulances have switched over to diesel. Our buses are mostly diesel. So in fact, in public administration, we have a lot of people exposed uh, to diesel exhaust in a similar way we do in transportation. So if we run that through our models, um, what we get when we combine, um, because we also have duration, because we've put that into those models, we end up with exposure levels measured in micrograms per meter cubed uh, uh, years, uh, which is the kind of thing you get out of a, kind of a detailed risk assessment. Um, this makes our approach to the modeling of the burden of cancer, one of the most detailed, if not the most detailed ever done uh, for some of these things, because we're, we're trying to be as quantitative as possible. Um, we have people that we've classified generally as low, moderate, and high. But when you add in duration into that, you actually see that it, there's a range there that's involved uh, with these things. But we get, again, very, very, very detailed estimate of how many people were historically exposed. And what that gives us when we've run this all through, the kind of summary stuff that comes out of our model, is that what it's telling us is that uh, 
6.8% of the population in 2011 have been exposed to diesel engine exhaust uh, during our relevant exposure period. That's 1.6 million uh, Canadians uh, had been exposed to diesel exhaust, which we now recognize as a car lung carcinogen. Uh, when we applied that kind of data to our dose response, to our dose response model, what that says is that there are 560 cancers annually in Canada caused by diesel engine exhaust. Um, and uh, now, there's a lot of lung cancer in Canada. That's 2.4% of, of all lung cancers. Uh, but still, when you think in terms of 560 people uh, that are getting diagnosed with a cancer that still has a very poor prognosis, five-year survival, unfortunately, is still not good for lung cancer. Uh, and I put in here the reference for the dose response modeling that we did. Uh, this is Rule Verbuen from uh, Utrecht University, uh, form, from, formerly from the U.S. National Cancer Institute. So here are our uh, kind of just a summary of our results. Uh, so I'm not going to run through all of them at the level of detail that you just saw, uh, but. Um, uh, these are the ones that were our biggest hitters in terms of numbers of cancers. And instead of giving the national numbers now, what you see here are the Ontario numbers. So these are from our report. So when you go down to diesel engine exhaust, instead of the 560 nationally, you see 170 in Ontario. Um, so these are just the Ontario numbers, and these are the estimated annual numbers of cancers caused by workplace uh, the major well-recognized workplace carcinogens, I should say. Top of the list is uh, solar UV at work. Um, certainly, uh, we have a lot of people who spend uh, a lot of their working lives outdoors. Um, and what we're saying is that 1,400 people annually are getting non-melanoma skin cancers. Now, these are not... Uh, this is not a high, highly fatal cancer. Uh, these are the kind of cancers, unlike melanoma, which is, uh, has a much higher uh, fatality rate. But still, this is 1,400 people getting skin cancer that really was caused by their work. Um, second is no surprise, it is um, asbestos. And um, here you see our numbers for uh, Ontario. Um, uh, 630 lung cancers, 140 mesotheliomas, uh, smaller numbers of laryngeal and ovarian cancers. Um, we'd also get, we, we're relying upon IR classifications and they're still in the probable category in terms of the digestive cancers and we didn't have estimates for those, although we could generate them. Diesel engine exhaust was our number three in terms of lung cancer, but also in terms of uh, potentially bladder cancer. Um, uh, bladder cancer is uh, not a definite association by IARC's classification, but it's a probable association. Um, crystalline silica, um, you see, actually is responsible for 200. Uh, welding fumes for another 100. Now, I think I told you before that we were saying 2.4% when we called, talked about diesel exhaust. But when you start to add all these things up, you get up more, you know, in the 10 to 15% of all lung cancers being related uh, to work. So lung cancer is uh, more, our most common site uh, for um, for, for occupational cancer, which isn't surprising given that a lot of our exposures to inhaling uh, various types of dusts and particles and chemical fumes. Um, we still have, you know, chromium and nickel are on here. Um, these are chromium and nickel, excluding the chromium and nickel that people experienced in welding fumes, uh, environmental tobacco smoke, uh, radon, arsenic, benzene. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are our combustion uh, products, basically when you burn almost anything organic, uh, and shift work. And when I put things in parentheses here, these are considered probable associations by IARC and not definite. Uh, but still, there was enough epidemiologic data to run them through and actually estimate numbers 
sometimes with a degree of uncertainty. So for instance, for shift work in breast cancer. But these are the kind of major hitters identified in the report. And again, you'll see a lot more detail on them in the actual report. At this point, I'm going to switch gears again, and I'm going to talk a bit about some of the policy recommendations, and then uh, we can have a bit of an open discussion. Um, were there any points of clarification? Because I, I realize I've been kind of going through and presenting a lot of material fairly quickly. Um, my knowledge of cancer is very rudimentary, but I know it's very complex in terms of the determinants. Mm -hmm. a lot of it, is there any analysis of other environmental exposures kind of conflicting or you know, any kind of further analysis to kind of see if non-application exposures are also in any of these samples if you will, further into it? Most cancers are the result of multiple risk factors. Um, and it's one of these kind of multifactorial diseases, as is are all, almost all chronic diseases. So it's not a matter that a person gets uh, lung cancer from asbestos, it's often asbestos plus smoking. Uh, or it might be uh, asbestos pl plus some other types of things. It's the reason why not everybody who is exposed gets cancer, and that's true even for cigarette smoking. Um, we, so we've looked at things. Now, the good news around that is if you remove any component of that, it can lead to prevention. So we're still focusing in on exposures, individual exposures here, because they represent the point at which we can introduce prevention into the equation. Uh, there is a large national project underway right now, also funded, excuse me, a little water, um, by um, uh, the Canadian Cancer Society that uh, I and other people across the country are involved in to look at other non-occupational risk factors, um, those that are uh, what we call behavioral or lifestyle risk factors, environmental risk factors, infectious diseases, um, physical agents, a whole bunch of other things, but the non-occupational ones. Um, but we haven't yet combined those into a single, uh, into a single uh, thing. But the percentages will add up to more than 100. Um, and although that's a difficult message sometimes to convey, uh, it is, uh, in fact, biologically what we know to happen. Um, for many years, we've had what we call the multi-stage theory of carcinogenesis that says, you know, there are things that happen at different stages that eventually lead to the cancer. Um, uh, we certainly know this biologically. So. Um, and as I mentioned, the prevention implications are still there. It gives you a lot of different ways to approach prevention. Hope that wasn't too long-winded of an answer. Cam? Thanks, Paul. Can you just talk a bit about the environmental tobacco smoke burden estimate? Yeah. I mean, I, the, exposure, the exposure here that you're estimating is lifetime exposure at work. Mm -hmm. And if we think back to the 60s, 70s, Right. I would think that the ever exposed cohort of people at work would be north of 50 to 60 to 60. Yeah. Just because of the prevalence of smoking. Work. The important measure, I, I think my reaction is it seemed like a low number, but I think what we've done, I guess this is Ken talking mm -hmm. about, is the duration and dose of. Mm -hmm. relative to a smoker is low even though the prevalence of being in environments where you smoke is quite high. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you raised that. I haven't tried to pull out, there have been differences in how we did some of these. Um, I gave people the kind of general model. When it comes to environmental tobacco smoke at work, what we were really looking at was the risk among non-smokers. So lifetime non-smokers, so that automatically reduces that pool of lung cancers a lot, since most of them are attributed to smokers. But it's hard to assess the risk in epidemiologic studies still about the added risk among smokers or even former smokers of secondhand smoke. Um, 
So this is taking, that's why these numbers are a bit of a small slice of it. Um, and I think that that helps to explain the difference in that. Uh, these numbers are kind, you know, they're, uh, it was interesting because we approach this quite differently in some ways, but in fact, when I look at stuff that's come out of the uh, people at the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, and you look at their attributable risk among non-smokers, this falls in pretty close to what they would have predicted. So we were pleased because our methods were quite different, and we were glad that we were kind of arriving around the same spot. Uh, but there is a degree of uncertainty for any of these things. But I, it's that, that's the important piece that I didn't mention, <laughs> is that it's just among the non-smokers at this point. Um, and certainly this is one of our only good news stories here is is probably in the area of environmental tobacco smoke because it was uh, so common back in the 60s and 70s and 80s and it wasn't until the 90s that it began to go down and in the 2000s when we really seriously put in legislation that prevented workplace uh, smoking. So we'll expect this to go down more in the future going forward. Other, other things that I said were uh, uh, that might need some clarification now. Otherwise, we'll have time for questions at the end. Oh, sorry. So, sorry, Gloria. Um, the last full amount, current exposure, how do you define it? Is it related to the exposure limit, as you were saying before? Um, no, this is, this is CAREX Canada numbers directly. CAREX Canada's uh, estimates of exposure are based on um, uh, you know, hazard and not risk. So it's the potential for, uh, for any exposure. Um, so it's casting a pretty broad net in that case. Um, now, you can also subdivide those, and I didn't, because this is a, a single table, to say, well, what proportion of these are above what we can think, consider the current exposure limits if we have them for this particular thing, because we don't have it for sun, for instance, and which ones are below half and which ones are between. Uh, so Carex estimates for the common exposures uh, like diesel, uh, crystalline silica, and some of these other ones, they have them separated out like this. But this is, this is casting that broad net for anybody who's at a potential uh, hazard of uh, exposure. Yes? Does melanoma have an established association with solar UV? It has a very strong association, but it's kind of different. and. There's still a disagreement, I think, in the occupational community. We, we, we went in a bit, uh, maybe a bit conservatively in terms of saying, of not putting melanoma in here. Usually melanoma is associated with um, things like being exposed at a young age, with things like an acute exposure, like being highly sunburned, uh, and things like that. It's, it's, usually assigned to non-occupational behavioral uh, activities, um, whereas occupational is, you know, generally long and slow. You know, people are exposed constantly to sun over many years. If they were getting a huge sunburn, that you wouldn't be able to work, right? So they've got it down to some extent, uh, and uh, but the nature of exposure is quite different in an occupational setting, and in fact, the uh, epidemiologic data is much stronger for non-melanoma skin cancer occupational associations than it is for occupational exposure associations for melanoma, if I've said that coherently and not screwed it up somehow. Uh, but uh, even within our group, there's some, uh, some people who be actually believe that uh, um, there is a risk for melanoma, uh, and it's just methodological challenges that have prevented us from identifying the nature of it. Sure. Okay. So I'll switch now gears and I'll talk a little bit about some of our recommendations. I've included, you know, some of the numbers from the previous thing. And I'm going to start with solar, um, where we see the greatest burden in construction, agriculture, other groups such as kind of uh, public works folks, recreational workers. Um, our policy recommendation is, you know, would be that, that we could require all workplaces uh, with workers uh, that are outdoor, 
for part of all of the day to develop a comprehensive multi-component self, you know, sun safety program. And there are there are recommendations for this out here, and this is certainly something that has been done in places like Australia, where the risk of sun exposure is much higher than here. Um, but it doesn't start to say that we don't have a risk at all here in in uh, in Canada. Uh, and certainly the Sun Safety at Work Canada project, which was a national project led by Thomas Tenkate at uh, Ryerson, uh, but that uh, Desiree and others from OCRC were also involved with, um, has a lot of recommendations about how to develop these kind of uh, sun protection programs. For asbestos, um, you know, Canada certainly has come out now with a proposed regulation that they've asked for comments on really just in the last uh, week or so, I think. Um, that actually quotes some of our burden numbers. I haven't checked to see whether they're correct yet or not because we haven't had enough time. Uh, but um, regardless of that, asbestos, there's so much existing asbestos in place uh, in buildings that most of our exposure now isn't from uh, new asbestos. It's from the fact uh, that we had decades for which we put asbestos in all types of buildings, uh, certainly uh, commercial, lots of public buildings, most of our schools that are older than the 1970s, um, you know, have substantial amounts of asbestos, you know. Cancer Care Ontario, St. Princess Margaret Hospital, you're not allowed to pound a nail in the wall or you'll get in trouble because there's asbestos behind those walls. Uh, we have a lot in place right now. So we have to think about um, how to approach that. Now, the federal government and the province of Saskatchewan have started uh, public building registries. That is, uh, that's the easiest place to start with a building registry. Um, and in fact, at various points in time, different levels of government have tried to um, collect data on where asbestos was used in various places, but uh, have never made that public. And the way that it's being approached now is identify these buildings, make it public, let everybody know where the asbestos uh, is, and make sure that everybody is aware if there's uh, if they're going in to uh, modify or repair a building or if they see deterioration of a building that they know to report that there's a hazard present. We're actually recommending that you know we could go beyond that and start to include um, uh, actually all buildings and workplaces that contain asbestos. So this would go beyond any of the current recommendations that are out there. And in a sense, it's a big challenge. Uh, but with the number of cancers that we're going to continue to see uh, from asbestos over the years, uh, I think it's a challenge that's worth, on, worth taking on. The other recommendation that we came on was to establish an interministerial working group uh, to deal with the prevention of asbestos-related disease. And the place that has done that is uh, British Columbia. Um, where they've recognized that there are elements of this that deal with um, not only uh, standard kind of workplace situations, but disposal of materials, uh, environmental regulations, import, export, lots of different, you know, in fact, ministries are involved with this. Um, and it's not something that needs to be siloed in a single ministry, and there should be some discussion, at least, between ministries about how to approach this. Um, uh, and possibly to talk about things like how do we accelerate uh, asbestos abatement. Uh, when I was entering the field of occupational health, uh, as I, I already thought asbestos was an old issue uh, back in the, uh, in the 1980s. I thought that it was on its way out. Um, and back then there was recognized that, you know, that we should uh, begin to abate or remove asbestos that's in place. Um, but the idea was you do more harm than good if you do that if it's safely contained. So that's been the philosophy. And 40 years later, buildings have deteriorated gradually over time. And in fact, we have not really accelerated our pace of abatement. Uh, this is a difficult decision. It's extremely expensive to do. Um, the one area I can think of that it was done is that in Ontario, we removed a lot of the lagging around pipes in schools. And there was a big subsidy from the uh, province to do that back I think in the 80s, uh, to remove a lot of that. But it removed a problem before, uh, before it could get worse. Um, but that was one of the only areas where it was removed from schools. Uh, 
Uh, now it's still in, in many different areas. So we could have a lot of discussions of those, and that could be done at a higher level, and I think needs to start happening. Diesel engine exhaust, um, we do not have specific exposure limits um, outside of uh, mining in the province of Ontario for diesel engine exhaust. Um, and in mining, they're way too high based upon the current state of knowledge. Even these recommendations uh, that um, we've come out with here, which we think are somewhat feasible, uh, would be considered slacking it if by the, the standards of the Netherlands, which has just come out with a one microgram per meter cubed, uh, which is basically what you get if you stand out on University Avenue. Um, that's the level at which risk assessment models say that we're creating uh, uh, cancer cases, uh, excess cancer cases for lung cancer. Um, so being up here at five and 20 at least is a starting point. 20 being for mining is a starting point, and this was a recommendation uh, out of Finland uh, uh, with the idea that it's gonna be harder to do. Mines are now considering trying to convert uh, over, but there also needs to be some incentives in place to push, um, uh, to replace old, uh, not only on-road, but off-road trucks and diesel engines. Uh, these off-road ones are a bigger challenge. Gradually, we're replacing the on-road ones, although certainly that has to be pushed as well. Um, there is a precedent for mandating the transition from, for on-road vehicles in jurisdictions such as California in that you don't just wait for a truck to get too old. Uh, you actually mandate that at a certain age it, get remo it gets removed if the engine is emitting too much diesel. Uh, crystalline silica has been something that has been with us uh, forever, probably. Um, uh, we are uh, just moving in these last years to including uh, construction under the occupational exposure limits here in Ontario, but we need to continue uh, to you know, really spread all of the protections of regulation to construction. Um, that, I understand, is I'm pretty sure is in the works now, um, but it takes a while to happen. Uh, but in addition, we have not kept up with occupational exposure limits when it comes to silica here in this province. Um, seven provinces have already moved to the ACGIH 2009 recommendation uh, for a lower exposure limit for crystalline silica, and we have not yet done so uh, here uh, in Ontario. Uh, so we could certainly be moving faster there. And I'm going to move a little faster so I leave time for questions. Welding fumes is another thing. This was just evaluated, um, I believe, in about a year ago and classified as a human carcinogen. We've always seen an increased risk of lung cancer in welders. Usually what people say, oh, that must be due to some specific metals like chromium uh, or nickel, which are, exist when you weld things like stainless steel. But there's been a recognition in recent years that very fine particles that pass deep into the lungs uh, will increase the risk of lung cancer even if they're relatively inert. And that includes uh, welding fumes. And there's such a consistent body of evidence around welding that now IARC has classified welding as a group one uh, carcinogen. Um, we had initially recommended ventilation requirements be introduced as part of the occupational health and safety uh, regulations here in the province. This was before we even knew that uh, welding was going to go move into group one with IARC. Um, so this is Paul's recommendation and not the recommendation of our very kind advisors, but I think they would agree if they were asked at this point in that we should actually have a specific occupational exposure limit for all forms of diesel exhaust, which are currently reg regulated more as a nuisance and not as a cancer uh, hazard. Um, so for things where there isn't chromium and nickel and things like that, uh, the regulations are way too high. Um, so we really need to move, I think, on that. Um, environmental tobacco smoke, um, as you know, as Cam raised and, and I talked about a little bit, has really gone down in recent years. But according to the Canadian Tobacco Use Monitoring Survey, there's still a substantial number of workers that are still reporting seeing cigarette smoking at work. Now, 
That's not a great survey in terms of occupational data. It's the only, the only big survey that we have, so we don't know how much that is. Is that, you know, people are seeing people smoking when they walk in the door and people are standing on either side, or is it people who are in a truck, which is not particularly well regulated, and the driver might be smoking and the passenger or vice versa is uh, there. It might be some small workplaces that are falling through the cracks. We're still estimating that there may be about 125,000 workers that are still exposed to environmental tobacco smoke at work. So we've come a long way on this, but maybe we could go further. Um, you know, radon, currently radon I think could be regulated much more strictly here. We There's often a, a talk about the norm guidelines, uh, but those actually could be legislated. Uh, uh, guidelines are not as enforceable, but also uh, Canada is up at about 200 uh, becquerels per meter cubed as uh, even our residential levels that we allow for exposure, and the WHO level is, is down at 100, and this is much lower uh, than what we would allow in workplaces. Um, and our enforcement is focused in on places like uranium mines. Uh, and not so much in other places. And uh, we just got funded for a study from uh, the Ministry of Labor to start looking at um, uh, just businesses in areas with high background levels. Because certainly all of our recommendations have said, oh, you should have your home tested. Uh, but people spend about a quarter of their life at work. So if there are high rate on levels at work, regardless of if you're in you know, a uranium mine or if you're in an you know, an insurance office where all your work is over the phone and the doors are closed all day and you're up north and the air is simply recirculated from the basement, you could actually have hazardous levels of radon even in your workplace. And that adds to your risk of lung cancer. Um, our general recommendations, one of them has been that you know, across all of these things, and I've given you a couple of examples that our occupational exposure limits uh, could be lowered. Um, our knowledge of health effects uh, are always driving forward. They're always saying that we're discovering levels of uh, exposure that are lower and lower that we know now cause health effects. And so we have to constantly be uh, lowering these things. And that's a challenge for uh, I'm sure some of the uh, industries involved, uh, but we don't want to fall behind on keeping up with the latest science. Um, now, historically, the ACGH TLV committee has not been known as your radical organization for making recommendations. I think they've done much better in recent years, uh, and they're trying to keep up now to the kind of an international standard of communicating with a lot of the other committees that are looking at the current state of evidence. Uh, but they're not, if you want to go really low, go to the Netherlands and look at what their recommendations are. And they are much, much lower than anything we recommend here in North America. But we're not even keeping up with the ACGIH at this point. And it's around a lot of these uh, things that we've mentioned here, even some nickel, chromium, formaldehyde, wood dust, all of which have been associated with, uh, with cancer, as well as the ones I mentioned earlier. Um, the Toxics Reduction Act um, is uh, now, it's, it's really, it was, we're unique in Canada of having a Toxics Reduction Act or a Toxic Use Reduction Act as it's called in the states. This is a very progressive measure, uh, but um, it was instituted with, I believe, some compromises. And um, it also was instituted primarily thinking in terms of the environment, and it makes sense. It's based at the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. Um, but we could be looking at it more as a tool to identify who is exposed where and be proactive uh, in using this data uh, for lowering exposures, workplace exposures, and think less of just emissions to the environment and thinking about the workers inside of workplaces. So we believe that this could be examined and potentially strengthened. And certainly we need more um, exposure surveillance and exposure registration uh, to help us prevent uh, these exposures going forward. And I've really stressed the 
cancerous effects of many of these exposures, but for most of the things I've talked about, they've also got other types of occupational diseases associated with them. So there are many benefits associated with, with lowering these things. But often the first step to doing that is knowing where hazardous exposures are occurring, and we don't really have the systems in place to, to do that as effectively as we would like to. So I haven't talked about some of the emerging issues today. We certainly have some of those in the report. We do talk about pesticides, antineoplastic agents, nanomaterials, things like sedentary work. Um, and so they're all, uh, there's bits of things in there. We tried to keep the light thin, but we've also given some references for further in information. Um, but otherwise, I'd just like to say thank you, and I'll leave this up for a bit. But this is the place where you can currently get um, uh, a copy of the report if you want to download it. Uh, in this day and age, we do a very limited print run uh, of ones, and it's uh, usually to hand to people like deputy ministers and associate deputy ministers to encourage them to take action on things. But um, you can certainly download copies of the report quite easily um, uh, from the web. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I have some time left, although not as much as I'd hoped for questions. I do have a question. In okay. terms of what's next, if you could be, are, are there ways the modeling is uh, going to be enhanced in the future? Mm -hmm. uh, it's very complex, very careful modeling. What would you have liked to have seen in terms of uh, changes for collecting data and, and you know, continuing to model in the future? <sighs> Well, it's, it'd always be good to have more current exposure data, and that's one of our, our challenges right now is that we don't have enough current exposure data to know where we currently stand. Um, we're trying to estimate that right now, and we have a project uh, in the construction sector uh, uh, with OCRC and IWH. Uh, Emil Tampa which is involved again, and we're, we're trying to project. Here we're looking, in this project, we're looking at what's the current number of cancers, how many people are currently exposed, how can we prevent future exposure. In this other project that's focusing on the construction sector, which is one of our biggest sectors in terms of numbers of people exposed, we're actually trying to project forward into the future well, what are the levels uh, of exposure and how many cancers will be caused in the future, and then what happens if we start instituting uh, dramatic reductions of exposure. How many cancers could we prevent uh, in the future? And so it's kind of this forward projection, which has been um, done some by the UK group, which we've uh, uh, we've based um, a number of our methods on, is the work that was developed at Imperial College. Now we have better input data than they had at Imperial College, and we have a bigger grant than they had, so we're able to do more with it. Uh, but a lot of the intellectual ideas of this came initially from them. Um, and so they've been very, very good partners to us. Uh, but that's one area where we want to go is projecting forward. Another area would be to maybe apply these methods to other diseases. Um, and uh, outside of the cancer area, other forms of chronic disease. Um, and we haven't moved on that yet, but I would like to, to do it in the area of, of things like respiratory disease, which share a lot of the same exposures, uh, so we could actually, it wouldn't be that big of a stretch to then try to do that for those kind of respiratory diseases. So those are two areas that we're, one we're actually on the way moving forward, another one that's just a bit of a twinkle in my eye at this point, but that I hope we move forward on. or if I overwhelmed everybody with details. <laughs> it was a very, very wonderful, interesting talk. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.